Hello everybody, Chris here, and in this video I'm going to show you how you can import a 2D character into Unity. So in Unity right now I'm working inside of a brand new 2D project, and on my desktop you can see I have a zip archive of a character that has been pulled off of itch.io. So if you want that same character you can find it here. And if we open up the archive of the folder, you can see the entire sprite sheet here and individual sprites listed inside of here. Now it's up to you if you'd rather have each individual image separated or not, but in terms of space efficiency, having everything packed into one or a couple sprite sheets rather than individual images is going to be more efficient. So if we want this sprite sheet, I can pull this out of the archive and then we need to add it to Unity. So to add it to Unity, we can still just do drag and drop. That's probably the easiest. So I'm going to right click inside of the project window and we'll create a new folder for this. So I'm gonna call this characters and I'll hit enter. If I want, I can go a level deeper and create a folder for players and enemies. But for right now, we'll just create a slime folder. So new folder and then slime. I'm gonna hit enter and go into here. And then I'm gonna drop the slime sheet into this folder. Now you can store your art anywhere inside of the project as long as you can find it and remember where everything is. Whatever organization method you want to use will work for you. Um, the way I, the way I've recently kind of switched to is that I'm going to contain all of the assets related to one character in the same folder. So as I create a character prefab or the actual game object that you would drop into scenes, that's going to be stored in this same folder with the actual slime animation sprite sheet. So we need a new game object for our character. So I'm going to right click in the scene and the hierarchy and then go to create empty. So we can call this game object slime and the slime game object has a transform component, but we need to add other components to it, namely a sprite renderer so that we can actually see the sprites of the slime. So I'm going to type in sprite so that I can find that sprite renderer. And now we need to add a sprite to this little box here. So as things are right now, this slime sheet has been brought in as a single sprite mode image, but we actually need to separate it into multiple images. As well as that, because this is a 2D pixel character, the filter mode and the compression should be set to point and none for the compression. So I'll go ahead and hit apply and then we'll work on the sprite mode single to multiple and separate it into different images. But uh, let's click on the slime game object and just drag this sprite sheet straight into it. And you can see that all of the sprite frames are being shown at once. So if we click on the slime sheet and we go to sprite mode single and change it to multiple, then now we can go into the sprite editor where we'll be able to slice up the sprite sheet into different images. So I'm going to hit apply here and now we're in this section here where we can slice it. Now generally I don't actually like to use automatic slicing. If there's any difference in the size of your individual frames then when you do automatic slicing it may not slice correctly. If we go ahead and hit slice here you can actually see that because these uh, lower frames where the slime is actually dying have less pixels that are actually visible. It slices around the only visible areas. So that is not going to work so well for us. We want the frames to be equal size with each other so that when it's actually rendering each frame individually, it's the, the slime will stay in the same place. So let's go from type automatic to, to grid by cell count. If you know the pixel size of each of your frames, you can do by cell size instead. But if you don't know the cell size, then going by cell count might be easier because all you need to do is count the rows and the columns. So we can see there is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight columns in this sprite sheet and three rows. So we just put eight for the columns, three for the rows, hit slice. And now all of our frames are perfectly sliced with each other. They have the same size and shape. So that's going to be what we want. If we go ahead and hit apply, then the sprite sheet is going to be sliced into those individual frames. And we can tell because on the sprite sheet image, there's now this little expand icon. And when you do that, you can see each frame individually. So let's go ahead and double click on our slime game object. Uh, we can see it's now saying 
missing a sprite because this has been separated into different images. So instead of the entire sheet, we need to drop one of these frames into here. So let's take the first idle frame, drop it on the sprite box, and there we have our little slime in game. Now we can see that this character is really tiny compared to the grid units of our game. Uh, there's technically no problem with that. If you want the character to render bigger compared to the unit size of everything over here, then you can change on the sprite sheet the pixels per unit as a setting. Generally speaking though, you'd want to keep this value consistent across the different characters in your game so that they are sized appropriately with each other. So if you wanted, you could change this to 32 and that's gonna mean that 32 pixels on this image equals one unit in the display space. If you don't mind having it as the original, you can just set it to 100 and hit apply. There's not really a problem with that, but you might need to take the main camera here and you can see the character's really small. So if you're working with really small characters and very high unit sizes, then you may want to change the size here to a value like one. And now if you go ahead and hit play, the uh, character will render much bigger than it would have otherwise because the camera is just much closer looking at the actual character. So let's take this a little bit further and add a couple animations to this character. So obviously we have a bunch of frames here and we want to put those in animations. Um, I'm thinking from this character, it's like idle, attack, idle, move, attack, hurt, and die. So let's try to get all of those animations real quick. I'll do add component animator so that this character can actually render animations. And with this animator object added to our slime, we can go up to window, animation, and then animation again. And we'll get this little box for creating animation clips. I'm gonna drag this to where we have console project as a third tab down here. And now let's go ahead and create animation clips. So we have idle as one animation. Let's go ahead and create that. Uh, but actually we need to use the project view as well. I'll put this up in the top right instead. So you can just drag and drop windows wherever you need them. So in this case, it's a little more convenient because we can take these frames and just drag them right into this animation window. So I'm gonna cheat a little bit and uh, open up the archive to see how many frames the move has. So it looks like four. So presumably that would be the first four frames here. So I'm gonna left click on the first frame, hold shift and then left click on the fourth frame to grab four frames. Now I drag this into the animation window. And if we hit play, our character should be doing the idle animation. But obviously that's playing back way too quick. So one way we can fix that is to space out our frames. So if I take all the frames past the first one and I pull them into five frame intervals, um, and this would be assuming 60 frames per second, then we can make the animation play back a bunch slower. There's other places you can actually change that as well. And then I'm gonna copy the last frame here and paste it at 20 so that when we get to the 15 frame here, it doesn't immediately go back to the start, but that that keeps playing until we're at 20. So now if we hit play, we should have our idle animation playing back a lot more smoothly and consistently. So the first frame, the second frame, the third one, the fourth one, and then the fourth one again, so that we can expand the duration of that fourth uh, frame of animation. So now we need to create more clips for the other animations. I'm gonna click on this dropdown, create new clip, and let's type in move.anim. Uh, note, I'm storing all of these animations also on the same folder, assets, characters, slime. Uh, so this is in the same folder that's gonna have the prefab game object, the character itself. Um, the art assets and now the animations, just keeping everything in one place. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit save here. And now let's grab the second, and now let's grab frames, and now let's grab frames five through eight for the movement, put them in here and figure out how much we need to space it, presumably. So I'm just gonna keep spacing these animation frames every uh, five frames of playback. So same kind of thing here, we have the move. Our first animation frame is here at zero, zero. The second one is at zero, five, and then zero, 10, zero, 15, zero, 20. And at that speed, it looks pretty close to how it should actually play back. So next we have the hurt animation. So same thing, 
So here we have our uh, first eight frames, which we've already used. And then it looks like these five are actually for attack. So we'll come back to her right now, I'll create the attack animation. And let's grab these five frames, pull them in here. Okay, zoom in a bit. And same kind of deal, we just gotta space these out however fast we want them to play back. And then I'm gonna copy this one more time. And then I'm gonna copy the final frame and put it at uh, 0.25 frames. And then we have our attack animation. So we can go back to move, make sure that is working nicely as well. Now, according to the archive, there's four frames for hurt. So I believe that will come after the attack. So let's see, one, two, three, four for hurt. Let's put it in there space out the image frames and let's hit play. Okay. And then finally the death animation. So this is the final four frames. Let's grab them, pop them in here, space out the animation frames, copy the last one and paste it into 020. And there we have our final animation. So at this point we've imported the sprites for a character game object into our game. We've set up all five of the animations and we can take this game object and use it as a prefab in our game. Basically a object that exists inside of our assets that we can copy into any scene. Likely you're gonna need to duplicate an enemy like a slime many times. So it makes sense to have a prefab. So I'm just gonna drag this into our slime folder and then that creates the prefab. Now, anytime we need a new slime, we could just drag that into a scene just like that. Easy peasy. So just finally, we're not going to get into setting up the animation state machine in this video, but if you go down to window animation and then animator, then you'll have this new window with all five of the animations that we just created. And it's here where you can set up the conditions for when your character should switch from one animation to another. So for instance, you could make a transition from idle to hurt and then you click on your transition, you add a condition, and maybe your condition is a parameter over here, which could be something like is a trigger, hurt, and then in your actual code, whenever the slime takes damage, then you would set this property to be triggered, and then you can have the conditions hurt as a condition for going from idle to hurt, and then that'll allow this animation to play then you can just make a transition back when that's done and return to idle or return to move depending on other conditions for your character. So obviously that's gonna be more of the logic and coding side of putting your character inside of the game, but at least for importing a basic character into here. Another thing you're likely going to need for all of your characters is going to be a 2D rigid body or 3D if you happen to be making a 3D game. So if you search in components, rigid body 2D, you can add that in here. So really quickly, a dynamic rigid body can be affected by forces. So it would be where you add uh, basically a force vector to your character, like 500 units of arbitrary force in this direction. And then this system here is going to determine how the character should move and at what velocity. But in uh, typical 2D platform and pixel art games, it would be more common to use a kinematic rigid body where the movement of this character is going to be determined from script rather than forces acting in a physics engine. So ultimately you may decide to go with a kinematic body and then in script you can tell it how it should move based on whatever state the character is in. And the states often are going to be based on these animation states over here. But also, if you want a rigid body to be able to collide with anything, to stop moving if it hits a wall or another character, then you're gonna need a collision shape. So we can go to add component and I'll put in a capsule collider here, pretty common for characters. So capsule collider 2D for a 2D game. Then you can hit edit collider down here and set the shape of the collider to be roughly the shape of your character. So in order to make it a horizontal capsule, we're gonna have to rotate it a bit. So let's go to direction and make it horizontal. So right now our capsule collider is a bit of a circle. We want it to be a horizontal and then thin vertically capsule. So I'm gonna change the direction from vertical to horizontal so that we can shrink it vertically. And I'm gonna to go to edit collider mode and we'll just shrink this until it matches the shape of our character. 
So these two things working together, if we put it in dynamic rigid body mode, it should be able to be affected by gravity and uh, the character should stop if it hits the ground. So let me just add a completely unrelated object to stop it from moving around. We'll add a little slime here, but I'm going to change its color to red so that we can tell it's different. Now, this is a slime, but we're just going to make it a static object. So in add component, going to do box collider. OK, and the box is just the shape of our character. I'll edit the collider and move this a little bit down there so it actually makes more sense. We'll also add in a rigid body 2D and I'm going to leave this in static mode. Static means that it can't move, but other objects can interact with it in the sense of a wall or floor. So another character can bump into it, but this will never move based on the physics engine alone. And we can rename this game object to or box slime, whatever. Now, if we go into game mode and we hit play, the slime should fall down onto the ground. So we see it actually landed there. If we move it a little bit higher, let's go ahead and put it up here. Maybe we'll be able to catch it in the fall. So let's go ahead and hit play. Then we can see it drops down. It bumps into it there. Once again, though, because our units are so high, we may need to change the gravity for this game. Now, if we're going to keep that 100 pixels per unit for a game like this, where the characters are just really tiny like this, uh, we may need to change the gravity value and slow it down. So we could go to edit project settings and I'm just going to type in gravity. So physics 2D, let's just take the gravity and make it something like negative 0.981. So just dividing it by 10. Let's go ahead and X that out, hit play, and then that should affect the gravity for all the rigid body characters in our game. So let's watch the character fall now, and it's much, much slower. And we can see the character is playing its default idle animation as well. So in a nutshell, we have imported our character into the game. We've set up the critical components for it. We haven't scripted our character out so that we can tell it how to switch states. We haven't set up the animator for a character to tell it how to switch states or the script for how it should move, especially if it's a kinematic character in your game, you would need a script for that 100%. So we've imported the art assets for our character into the game. We've set up all the animations. We've created the minimal components, I would say, for a 2D character. Uh, we haven't done the scripting for how this character should interact with the game, obviously, and we haven't quite set up the animator for controlling how it's going to move between those different animation states. When should it play the attack state and the move state and the death state? That's going to be very specific to each character. So for now, I'm going to leave it at that for this video. I hope this tutorial helped you guys get to the basic state of just importing your character into the game, getting a simple game object going, and at least creating the foundation for where you can start scripting from and determining how your character should actually act within the game. Um, so I've been Chris, thanks for watching, and hopefully I'll see you guys in my future Unity content as well.